All right, here we are, 23rd of July, uh, week 11 of the conference. Um, have a have a great presentation today from a, a panel, actually. Um, it's been quite a bit of work to get the government to engage, here in North America at least, in this research. And I would say, you know, thank you to David, David, David and David and um, Proatin. This is a a project that's been going on for almost um, more than two years now. Um, I think we have some great insights to uh, share about um, how you can measure nutrient variation and the market um, dynamics. What is research? Where are we at? People on the ground for the past two or three years. Um, I think, David, you're, you're first. We've got uh, four people presenting today, David and Ben and Christy and, and Wood. Um, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think we're just going to do a quick round of intros and then loop back and go through what we've been working on for a couple of years. Um, really happy to be here with everybody. Uh, we've all had the chance to work together, you know, for a couple of years now, so it's fun. Um, yeah. my name is David Strelnick. Uh, this intro, I own a eight acre farm parcel in the state of Maine, and I've spent about 25 or 30 years working in with sort of on the ground uh, environmental and, 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 and regenerative enterprises in, in quite a few countries, including the US. And I, I focus on the economics. What are the economics that can actually drive regenerative enterprise and a regenerative future? Um, both in learning about that and then working with on the ground entrepreneurs to try to apply it. So, uh, it's my third chance to to to, to be in talk at this at, at Dan's conference over the last seven years. So thank you, Dan, and thanks everybody. Um, Wood, hey folks, I'm Wood Turner. I'm uh, head of ESG and regenerative impact at Agriculture Capital. We're an investment management company uh, based in San Francisco and Portland, focused on um, uh, permanent crops on the west coast of the U.S. and in Australia. Uh, we're specifically uh, focused on organic blueberries. Uh, up and down the West Coast uh, and a large citrus business in California and Australia. I also uh, am leading the uh, transition of my family's farm in Eastern North Carolina to organic. Um, and I have a seat, I sit on the National Organic Standards Board in my fifth year of a five-year term. Uh, I joined AC about 10 years ago. I came from uh, leading sustainability at Stonyfield Farm, the organic yogurt company based in New England, uh, and have been focused on uh, uh, sustainability in business uh, for my whole career. Nice to be here. Hey everyone, thanks for uh, having us on and also being here. My name is Ben Adolph with Merge Impact. I'm the co-founder and CIO. Uh, Merge was founded in 2023, early 2023, to be a software platform to help connect stakeholders uh, in the pursuit of uh, regenerative and organic and uh, conventional transitioning regenerative supply chains. Uh, we are here to help align and organize and distribute data uh, through an analytical dash, a reporting dash, and as well as a marketplace experience. And our role in this was to provide software solutions to all of the stakeholders for data organization and distribution, and as well as a software for the marketplace uh, solution that this group was focused on. So we'll cover some of that today. So thank you all for having us. Hi, thank, uh, my name is Christy Electris. I'm the executive director of Croatan Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit with a mission to build social equity and ecological resilience by leveraging finance to create pathways to just economy. And we do that through research and action. Um, our approach is to create sustainable long-term change on the ground and in capital markets in order to create systems change so we work with both investors to redirect capital into regenerative and restorative investments um, in regenerative ag and other areas, um, as well as working with communities to access the tools of finance that help them um, access finance that meets their needs. Um, so we have a few different programs. Uh, this project um, that we're going to talk about today is part of our soil wealth program that's focused on unlocking finance for regenerative food farm and forestry value chains uh, to build soil health and community wealth. Um, so we, um, I'm excited to talk about it. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. I think I'm going to transition into a presentation. 
um, in a second. The other two programs that we have um, in the Institute is one on racial equity, economics, finance, and sustainability, where we're building financial resilience for individual households for focused on BIPOC and underserved farmers and land stewards in North Carolina through, um, through a variety of projects that we're doing on the ground uh, across the state, working again to help um, to help the farmers on the ground understand how to access the finance that's meeting their needs, and also working um, to build a diverse leaders in climate and agriculture network uh, and provide tools for investors to influence decision making. Uh, and more broadly, we, we do this across a variety of themes in our um, investor research and action program. So let me transition. Um, I'm And I'm based in the Boston area, even though we're headquartered in North Carolina, uh, we kind of have a a broader scope than that. So I need to share my screen for one moment. Um, and I've been, um, this project has been really fun to get to know all of these participants that are here today and, and all these organizations. Um, I, you know, we've done this so many times, but let me see, where's the share? There it is. Um, it, it says it's disabled for screen sharing. Dan or Shauna, if you could. Let me know if you can um, un or re enable screen sharing or I can send you the presentation. But I can start talking about it. Um, so, this project um, has um, the title. I'm, I'm sorry, Christy. Yeah, I, I just yeah. texted Shauna. We're having okay. a technical difficulties on the side, but she's working on it. Okay. Yeah. So Would just, it be helpful if I sent my presentation to y'all? Sure, but I think she'll get it figured out in about thirty seconds. Okay. I was just to start. Yeah. Okay. So this um this project is um the title is incentivizing conservation ad adoption through food quality marketplaces. It was a USDA conservation innovation grant that um, Croton Institute and Nourish to the end degree um. With, uh, and BFA itself uh, were partners in um, applying for several years ago, and uh, we're currently extending that project timeline to end, um, probably wrap up by the end of this calendar year, but we have technically through next year. Um, the, the goal or the question that this all started with was, can food quality drive market demand for conservation farm products? And um, our goal was to really support and learn from actual market transactions and related insights in order to gather details about those market drivers so that, you know, each of us as partners in the project, um, the USDA and other market players could put this new information into play in our future work. The, um, it began in March 2022 and with our partner match, um, that the USDA requires, we've reached over a $2 million effort around this work. And so there's clearly a lot of people, a lot of energy going into this, um, this space. Um, we're collaborating with, as I said, Nourish, Bionutrient Food Association, Agriculture Capital, and Merge Impact, as well as a variety of other stakeholders. Um, oh, and I can share now, so I can show you my, um, my list of partners, one second. Okay, so I'll just, uh, can you all see that? Looks good. Uh, okay, great. Um, so, I mean, the, the objectives of the project have been to, again, identify the attributes of conservation, food quality, and um, socioeconomic characteristics of farms that can we can associate with the agricultural food products in the marketplace, and figuring out those attributes um, and, you know, our hypothesis was that these differing attributes can support new and expanded markets for conservation and regenerative farms, which would drive economic demand and boost farmer income um, through thing, increased prices for the products, but also additional sources of revenue that can come from other uh, demand centers. Um, a major goal of the project has been to help facilitate, learn from, and give recommendations of on-market 
uh, on market transactions that reflect the nutritional, environmental, and social benefits of regeneratively grown farm products. And finally, we um, have been trying to leverage the research on the food quality marketplaces to attract traditional finance or unlock additional finance to soil health building conservation regenerative practices across asset classes. So here's um, a, a display of all our partners and additional stakeholders include um, biodiversity, mad agriculture, turquoise mountain farms, and other individual farm participants that worked um, with us throughout this process. I, a major component of this work, and we'll get into it, or rather, um, Ben will get into it a little bit more, is some of the innovative data generation and also data um, uh, display um, and, and on how to manage that. So we um, wanted to use nutritional and biodiversity testing uh, provided by farm. Uh, we wanted to explore how, how we could use nutritional and biodiversity testing. Um, by providing farmers and market-facing partners access to advanced and novel t uh, data about the crops they're growing and, se and selling. And um, Bionutrient Food Association has been doing nutrient density testing for years, as many of you know, um, and also has recently pioneered their new metabolomics analysis uh, that really highlights the complexity of crops um, and what, what is underlying in the nutritional profile. And here you just see a quick, <laughs> Um, snapshot of, of what one particular crop that we tested, um, just a little sliver of the amount of data that we could understand about the types of compounds that are inside it, types of phytochemicals um, between different sa uh, tested samples. Um, in this case, um, there, there's actually much more detailed breakdown of those that, than we're showing here. Um, and it's really exploratory data. It's not ready for claims, but it was an insightful way to show our partners and to understand uh, for the broader field of stakeholders uh, what may be possible. Um, there's also potential for comparing this kind of data over time to see how growing practices can improve nutritional qualities in the food itself. Uh, over this project, we tested uh, wheat, oats, buckwheat, sunflower, and blueberries, um, among others that um, BFA has been testing um, for many years. Um, the second type of data, um, we offered some testing, some novel testing with several of the farms, not all of the farms that we worked with, um, to access what's called biodiversities, um, uh, bio monitoring testing that uses bee pollen collection as a way to uh, quantify the environment around surrounding a farm. And it's, it's the only tool that, um, allows the collection of both qualitative and quantitative data on the number of number and type of plant species that are present and their deficiency or impact on the whole ecosystem. Um, this, this novel approach uses bees as the monitor and it helps gather um, pollen from the, the biodiversity in the surrounding area as far as a bee can travel. Uh, so it's really unique. Um, it also provides the type, concentration, and impact of industrial agricultural pollution and, um, and does this over large areas at a rather low cost and at a, at a continual basis. Uh, um, and it can help us identify areas of improvement or validate existing conditions uh, or practices and helps you understand the quality of the pollen in relationship to the bee and other pollinators um, to understand what's, what's going on below the surface. Um, farmers were able to, and the market partners were able to explore vegetal diversity, pesticide and heavy metal presence, and the pollen nutritional value. And finally, um, the uh, Merge Impact has been a great partner, and they've been developing an updated dashboard, which um, we're going to see a lot more of, so this is just a kind of preview. Um, but uh, the we wanted to explore the market implications of these differentiated attributes of regeneratively grown products and the insights from the partners regarding the uses of data in the market and other market drivers. So Merge Impact has been connecting um, through their flexible dashboard, both land and practice data of farms with sustainability data, including carbon, water, and biodiversity data. And this type of novel nutritional data um, is being integrated into this dashboard and can connect, help connect supply chain actors uh, that care about the different value propositions and help build out that market. So um, I'm going to um, just preview the rest of the conversation and um, after, I'm gonna turn it over to David from Nourish 
uh, to talk about the economics and activating the economics, and then we'll go to Ben to talk more about that dashboard. And um, uh, Wood Turner from Agriculture Capital is one of the um, going to be able to provide us a perspective of um, uh, both a market partner and an implementer, uh, and someone who's gone through learning about this, you know, these different data techniques in relationship to actual farm practices uh, that they manage directly. So I will, and then I'll um, at the end I'll circle back and talk a little bit about the research we've been underway right now around investors and and how to increase um, investment into this space. So I will turn it over to David. Thanks, Christy. Will you continue operating the, the slides? Sure, no problem. Great. Um, thank you, Super. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes um, just to try to share some framing in terms of what we were trying to do and what we actually ended up accomplishing to this point. Um, if I took one step back from what Christy just shared, I'd say when when I and uh, David from Croton decided to apply for this USDA Conservation Innovation Grant to begin with, um, for which we're very grateful for USDA support. Thank you if you're listening. Um, um, the key question for us and for my work for many years before has been like, okay, what are the drivers in society that will that will incentivize the adoption of these? of these regenerative practices in farming and in foods, also in health and wellness, and also in the environmental sector. So, so uh, our focus was less on the science and technicalities of those are fundamental to anything, you know, we can do, but more like, like the, the incentives and systems at play that can support farmers, support health institutions, support consumers or policymakers or others. Um, and so the real focus, uh, while what I'm gonna show in a minute looks a little bit theoretical or analytical because it is, the real focus was, how do you put this data in the hands of real real life market players, people on the ground like Wood Turner and Ben and others who are, who are out there making, making things happen, um, real life things with the land and with people in the food markets. So, so a lot of this has been an exploration of that of that question, like uh, how, how do you bridge the theoretical and the intellectual or academic aspects of this to the real live market players? Um, uh, thank you, next slide. Um, so, so in terms of activating the economics, again, by looking to it's places where these kinds of transactions are happening in the world, wherever they're happening, uh, we're basically aiming for that gold star. Uh, what is at the overlap of the science, the farming practices, the health qualities of foods and the economics? Um, so that's that's our quest. Next. Um, so we went through an analytic exercise that, that took over a year and it's basically, uh, we wanted to make sure that we understood what is known and isn't known about the underlying science um, so that we could help translate that into the economic terms, the economic lessons and principles. So I'm gonna rattle through this very briefly, but uh, what you're gonna see now is available as a, as a, as a one-page written introduction and a copy of the chart you're gonna see anytime for anybody and a 48 page reference note that accompanies it. So if you if you want those additional resources, just, just reach out and ask. Um, so we started with the premise that there are six things a farmer does or a land care manager does that might affect uh, the health qualities of the food that's produced on that land. Um, uh, we, the purpose of today isn't to debate, discuss these, but briefly you, you, you pick the crop or the seed or the animal you're gonna grow, you, manage the soil, that's number two. Number three is you manage the ecosystem or you, you may manage the ecosystem around that site. Number four is you might do something that manages the plant or the animal, the crop itself, independent of the soil and independent of the ecosystem, you might actually do some things directly to the crop. Number five, in terms of health qualities, you do some things that actually affect the quality of the crop after it's harvested and before it leaves your farm site. And number six, throughout any of this, you might or might not use compounds uh, that in some cases can be harmful to humans is the language we used. 
Um, and because we're tracking back to health qualities, uh, this, this was important. Uh, next, uh, not at all gonna go into this detail, but each of those six categories, we broke down into number of detailed practices from use of biochar to agroforestry to crop rotation to no-till to using uh, uh, growth inhibitors to increase storage life, et cetera. So, so our analysis took detailed practices and rolled them up into the sort of the six major categories of, of what these detailed practices support. Next. And then we have worked really hard to map that to health qualities of foods that are produced, to map each one of those, each one of those categories. So uh, which of these, if any, and in what way, based on what scientific knowledge or what gaps in scientific knowledge affect, and these are the bullet points in this little box, conventional nutrients, dietary fiber, secondary compounds or phytonutrients, including polyphenols and antioxidants. Uh, you've got microbiome, um, calories, or the ratio between calories and other nutritional determinants, and toxicity. Um, so having done that, now we're, we're in the column titled value propositions. We're getting into the economics because what we want to ask is, so, so who, who in society is either going to pay or transact in other ways for foods that have these qualities? and therefore drive resources and incentives back to the farmers or the land managers to, to produce foods in these ways. So, uh, Christy, go ahead. Um, what we did was by looking at actual enterprises, some that we work with in my company, Nourish, directly, and a lot of others around the country and elsewhere, we identified 13 economic values or value propositions that that in some cases are the basis of the transaction that's taking place. So not everybody is buying food for its health qualities or trading it or producing it for health. Some are. Um, the others just really quickly to name them are uh, standardized shape or color or size of the product. Uh, by far the, the biggest market segment today is represented by that, character, that economic characteristic of foods that are grown. Um, the aroma or flavor of the food, its impact on climate change, including carbon sequestration, uh, its biodiversity value, whether you're uh, thinking of trading credits or just you value nature in your life, uh, it holds value that people will base their behaviors and transactions on sometimes. Um, the re resilience of the, of the landscape you're on, the resilience of the local food system where you are, water quality, uh, pollinator health and vitality, uh, community and cultural values, uh, reducing pollution, farm worker health and safety, and the actual land value, uh, if you were to, to, to value and market the property itself. These are the economic value propositions that we identified, track back to being influenced by these different farming practices. And finally, now you get to see the spider web of arrows where we tried to map all of these practices to all of those economics. <laughs> um, and go ahead and hit the next one also, Christy. And then those same, those same arrows, that spider web of arrows is represented by the colored dots that track back to the six farming practices on the left-hand side. Um, go ahead, Christy, hit the next one. So now everybody take a deep breath and go, ha. Ah. So now we're left with an economics chart that says, essentially, these different six practices affect different economic value propositions. And you can begin to see that, for example, the one with the little red dot down the middle, ecosystem management practices, managing the biodiversity in the ecosystem around the farm, turns out to affect 12 of the 13 more than any other of the practices. So... I love this stuff because I trained in economics, but what do you do with it, right? That's the next question. But what you just saw was the first set of deliverables that we produced, that is what we call the reference framework, the foundation for all the other pieces. Um, happy to discuss more or, 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 or later in other times. Uh, just one more, one more set of, of work we've done here, again, in collaboration with the market players and others to try to, try to put this stuff into practice. Um, go ahead, Christine. We asked for each of those, we began to ask 
right? We got as far as we could get in asking. So who is procuring or buying or requesting each of those different values? Who in society? What consumer segments? Consumers, who are they? Are they companies? Are they individual consumers? Are they governments? Are they, what are they? Um, which of those 13 products or values is it that they're consuming? Uh, why do they want it? What are the incentives to the degree that we could understand that? And then did we learn anything therefore about business models that could be put into play in the world that other market players might learn from or adapt or develop or entrepreneur around? Uh, this is just a quick rundown of this information. Um, and then I'm gonna stop and hand it off to Ben, but um, this is the broader framework and, and the tidbits that we sort of try to organize put into play. Uh, go ahead, who's procuring it? In this case, 14 consumer segments we identified uh, while they generally, I think, make sense. They aren't on this list because they make sense. They're on this list because we did months of research and interviews and talked to people. And these are the ones we found uh, one way or another actually transacting uh, quite a bit or just a little bit, but some actual transactions. So the intent of showing this today is just to say, look at the range of consumer segments, it, individuals, chefs, restaurants and bakeries, consumer product companies, uh, brokers of food products, medical providers, just going down the list, community stakeholders, municipalities who are interested in climate change resilience and local food system resiliency, university food services, uh, health insurance companies, grocery retailers. Um, I would note that if we get into the, the additional, again, as much research as we were able to do and, and, and get our heads around, around these, uh, a conclusion that we're not diving in today is that this is a nice long list, but actually there aren't that many transactions taking place. It's an interesting list of players. There's a little bit of commerce here and there, um, more in some areas than others. But while the list is big, there's not a whole lot of action, certainly not relative to conventional or traditional food markets. Um, next. Um, so we've kind of already said this, but what, what then is it that the, the people, these people, these consumer segments are interested in? Why are they buying these foods? Um, sometimes it's the food itself. Sometimes it's they want a certification. They want to qualify for a certification. <laughs> and so uh, sometimes it's they, they want, as they sell their product, they want to be able to tell the stories of the producers because it turns out that stories of people on the ground sell in the marketplace in many cases. Um, ESG data to demonstrate their own corporate or company environmental uh, social uh, sustainability goals. Um, and governance accomplishments um, um, because their customers downstream demanded it. Their customers said, I want this kind of product. So they responded um, uh, uh, because they were subsidized or got grants because they actually, in some cases, were able to save money, cost savings, um, because they have a vision of a vibrant, sustainable future of life. It turns out that that's why some people actually are transacting <laughs> these products. And the bottom one, influencer vibes, is a big deal. There's a thing in the world today in the world of economics called influencers, right? And uh, reaching those influencers can do a heck of a lot to building your brand or disseminating demand for your product. And sometimes these, these market players, it turns out, are motivated simply because they're trying to reach the influencers. Um, uh, next, we're just about done here. Um, so if you pause for a sec, then if you if you're a market player, if you want to be a market player, if you want to influence or support market players, what have we learned? Well, these five bullets just basically mean there's five dominant models through which we saw transactions actually taking place. One is direct sales from the producer to a consumer, whether the consumer is an individual or a company or somebody. Uh, the second with the star next to it is what we call aggregators, which is which is sort of a third party sitting between the producer and the consumer who pulls together a lot of product, repackages it or remarkets it in different ways. 
And the star there is meant to say something really, really, really important. And I think in this assessment and certainly in my own work at, at Nourish, which is that they also, some of the leading innovators and, and ones that are growing in this field are ones who don't aggregate the product, they aggregate the value propositions. They're, they're packaging up biodiversity impact with local food system resilience, with higher nutrition and repackaging that and selling it either to single consumers or selling those different values to different funders or de demand side consumers. So there's a nuance there that on the economic side is pretty important and I think full of big potential. Um, finally, and I'll be done, there's, there's brokers who are hooking up buyers and sellers. They aren't necessarily acquiring the product themselves and reselling, but they're, they're, they're connecting the dots. You'll listen to Ben in just a minute, talk about his role in that space. Uh, there are vertically integrated companies, whether they're big or small, uh, like Wood Turners, where they have front end retail operations selling to consumers and they have, you know, back end farms growing blueberries and, and you know, the product is flowing all the way up and down that chain. Um, there are also, and that's sort of top down vertical integration. There's also bottom up where the farmer, <laughs> the farmer is starting to make their own product. Uh, one of the partners in this, or with participant farmers in this, in this project is, is, is um, called Prairie Grass Ranch. And a, they created a product called Gruff Grits in Montana. And so the farmers themselves are, have developed a consumer facing food product in a box that's, that's, that's really good. <laughs> I endorse it personally uh, for flavor and for its, its holistic impact of both on health and environment. And finally, um, we saw cases of dedicated buyers meeting public programs, uh, food programs, institutions, hospitals who are, who are set up to purchase 100% of whatever a farmer, certain farmer might, might produce. Um, that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Take the pause. And uh, again, the real action on all of this is with the, the other folks here who are, who are doing the work yeah, out in the marketplace. Thanks, David. So I think we're turning it to Ben, who's going to share his screen, I believe. Okay, so I will dive into the beautiful world of data and kind of touch again on what our purpose here was with this grant and continues to be with this grant. Uh, as was mentioned by a couple other partners, there's more to this than nutrient data. And that's a big focus of our group is the, the other things. Uh, so what we're focused on are, is not just the nutritional components, but how we get those nutritional components from a soil practice and farming practice standpoint. So we're, we are collecting the data around uh, some other categories around the farm. So how do we impact emissions? How do we impact soil carbon stocks? How are we impacting biodiversity? Uh, all through the tasks that are performed on the farm. And then how do we relate that to the type of agriculture happening on the farm? and how do those types of agriculture relate to the nutritional uh, data sets that we were producing. So for this, we we're gonna focus on one farm in particular, which we have the most comprehensive data on today. Uh, we'll be gradually getting more data from the other farms in this study as we continue on. This is the most comprehensive data set we have today uh, is with this farm here. Um, see why that's not turning, there we go. Uh, so just again, on what we do is we help produce this type of data for stakeholders and supply chains. So you may not know which farm A or farm B and how they produce. Uh, we may not know that information. And what we help bring is that information to the front end so the downstream can recognize it. Uh, so you look here with soil health, antioxidant data, which was part of this study, the biodiversity index, which is a merge only uh, product, and then the carbon emissions data associated with this. Uh, the dashboard that was mentioned, we'll dive into uh, first. Yeah, it was just up. So we have some security limits, so it does kick us in and out as we leave. So. 
So here's the dashboard for this farm uh, that we've been approved to share with everyone on this call, which is the A-frame farm, which a lot of people in the regenerative space know. Uh, A-frame farm is in Dawson, Minnesota. And, and this is a summary of the data. So all of our clients have a custom dashboard. This, you know, this grant has its own dashboard view of all the farms together. And then this is an individual farm view. Uh, we have our biodiversity data in the top right. And then the data of interest for this call is this uh, nutrient density data. So these are the, the green bars represent the advantage over the other farming systems, primarily conventional. Uh, within the sunflowers data, we had conventional and natural versus regenerative organic data. And I have some slides to summarize this. Other, uh, you know, we're just showing you that there is a dashboard with this data here. The dashboard serves two purposes, uh, analytics and custom reporting. So we can custom report any of this data off uh, for any of our stakeholders as needed. So let's see, we have uh, quite a bit of data on here. We also have the uh, Geo Explorer, which shows you where the habitat and conservation areas are. If I can remove some other windows here. As well as it has our um, data set for the biodiversity and habitat work that we did. So drive in locally. So you can see existing conservation area here. Um, everything we had sitting on the database on the backside, uniquely identified. Try to find some pictures. So here is our actual, whoop, wrong way. The actual picture that we've taken as part of our assessment. Two lady beetles in that, the way it looks. Uh, so that's a, some of the, this is data coming directly from this farm. Uh, this farm, I will summarize uh, off of this. We'll go back to my slides. Uh, we'll just jump into the crops and what we noticed from this farm. Uh, so this is buckwheat. Antioxidant levels were 75 or 74% higher, and then we had quite a bit of increase in, in some of our uh, nutrients, our minerals at the bottom. So there's a massive amount of data that was brought in through this grant, uh, very comprehensive nutrition analysis. Our role was to try to find the data points that were relevant to the consumer markets. So what is the consumer paying attention to when they look at information from a product? And then how do we help that producer you know, take this message downstream? And that's what you see on the right is just some messages that this specific producer can say about their buckwheat. When we looked at the wheat, we saw you know, not as exceptional on the antioxidant side, but we did see quite a bit of, of a nutrition uptick in the minerals and vitamin side. Uh, there was also some uh, movement in the omega-3 side of it. And then back into the sunflowers where we had a natural sample as well as a conventional sample, significant advantages over the conventional sample. Uh, we looked at, again, we tried to focus on these three minerals as our you know, primary data that we would bring through. There were quite a few minerals listed that had significant uh, upticks over conventional samples. So it wasn't just the potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus. There were quite a few across the board. So I would say that our observation on this farm in particular was that the regenerative organic farming system had a significant advantage over conventional farming systems for nutrient quality. Uh, that's very specific to this farm. There were limitations to the research. Putting all of this data together and then offering some perspective on it, what we wanted to look at were within all of the crops that we sampled, we wanted to really understand the proximity to habitat and also some of the soil health and soil carbon information. Since this is a first year study and we only had baselines, we don't have changes in these systems from the farming practice. We only have baseline data and, and what we found in 2023. So when we did a biodiversity index on this farm, it was a 2.41. Typical biodiversity indices for our conventional producers is under one. So we know that this farm is proactively managing for biodiversity, habitat, and conservation within their farming system. Every field sampled for this had active habitat in field or 
within proximity of it. Uh, these were all infield, actually. Uh, some fields have habitat in an adjacent boundary, not considered under that have under that boundary. Average soil health index for U.S. corn is eight and a half. Uh, compared to that, we have numbers in these fields in the mid to high teens, other than our sunflowers, which had uh, nine point three five. So that's uh, bringing all of that data together. And then where that actually ends up is uh, in our marketplace, where you can see this on a product. Uh, so if you uh, look into here. Now, I will also say that none of the products sampled in this grant are actually listed on our marketplace. The main reason for that is they they don't need the market. Uh, so we didn't have to bring exposure to those products. So these are open products that can be purchased right now. Uh, and then the highlighted information on the bottom right of these cards tells you what data is present on those cards. I will go into, just pick one of these. Um, purpose of our marketplace was to bring exposure to this uh, cropping these cropping systems. Primarily, the purpose of our marketplace is to show you that you can get highly granular with data collection and bring it into a product as it travels through a supply chain into the into the uh, marketplace. So, as the marketplace partner in this grant, David and others have brought in tons of very valuable market data. They're not coming from our marketplace. Like we are not transacting goods through our marketplace for this data on these crops. And I mentioned one, they didn't need the market, but also the market hasn't evolved into that yet. The purpose of us building a marketplace that looks like this, that has this data, is quite simply to show you that it's possible to get data from farms, measure those for conservation, soil quality, soil health, and actually let that travel with the product through the supply chain. Uh, so we're not trying to wow anyone. I know there will be questions like, who's paying premiums for this data? Uh, not not a question for us because what we're here to do is just show you that there's data to discover and get it into that supply chain and downstream in a supply chain. Uh, there we do have you know customers that are working with us in that in that scope. But that's really the point is to show you that you can all you know work through this system to get nutrition data associated with climate impact data on the product as you would want to procure it. So I'm logged out, so you can see some of this is blurred. Uh, this is a critical conservation area, it is the uh, prairie grasslands region, as well as overlap with the upper Mississippi uh, River Basin. Yeah, so those are the two conservation areas this came from. I think that's all we had. Um, for our portion of this, and we will dive into that, I'm sure, with question and answer here shortly. Yep. All right. I am done with, with my part, then. Great. Thanks, Ben. So I think we're turning it over to Wood, uh, who's also involved in different portions of different aspects of the project, even so late at that last week or two weeks ago, helping us uh, think through on the investment side. So all the way from the farm to the marketplace and the investment um, needs of, of this transition. Uh, great, it's great to be here with you all today. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit of our thoughts. I think, uh, you know, as a as a participant in the in the in the conservation innovation grant and the work that we were trying to do here. I think our point of view has been very uh, focused on kind of practical applications. And, and I, I, I don't want to spend, I, I'm looking forward to kind of getting into a discussion with folks on kind of what that all means for, for us. But, uh, you know, we, uh, just a quick, just to kind of continue on with my introduction a little bit ago, you know, we launched about 10 years ago, um, focused on permanent crops on the West Coast of, of the US and Australia. Uh, trying to build uh, a large organic blueberry business and uh, a citrus business as well. So, um, if you have, um, hopefully, if you're if you're a buyer of blueberry of, of organic blueberries from retail um, 
uh, from from retail uh, large retailers across the country. You've probably you've probably accessed our blueberries in, in a variety of ways. We've historically sold through different marketing companies that you're probably familiar with uh, who who market our blueberries for us. But one of the things we realized over the last several years was that a lot of those partners really weren't able to kind of communicate or convey some of the real beneficial aspects of the berries that we were growing uh, outside of sort of a, a commodity pool, even if that commodity pool was an organic pool. Uh, and so, you know, this is a, these are farms in particular, and I'm, I've got a picture an image up on the screen here is sort of a general sense of sort of where our organic, where, where our, our Oregon blueberry uh, uh, operations are. I, I, I don't have the California images, images on the screen, but if you can, you can access our, this is uh, from our most recent impact report, you can access these on our website at agriculturecapital.com. Um, but, um, you know, we've been spending a, a huge amount of time on these farms, building soil, uh, using regenerative practices, uh, focusing on organic practices as well, uh, really focusing on kind of a core, a core of what I did as a graduate student, which was thinking about wildlife, wildlife con connectivity across working lands. Um, and so we really wanted to sort of challenge a thesis or, 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 or uh, look at look at a, a a belief that we had that uh, if we could re restore wildlife connectivity across blueberry farms in the Northwest, um, could we potentially um, rely less heavily on rented bees? Who, by the way, when honeybees, you know, to me, it's not an indication of health when you see hives along the side of the road. You may think, oh, look at those look at those honeybees, they're great. Honeybees are livestock. Honeybees are working animals. Uh, by the time they've made it to most blueberries on the West Coast, they've been they've been pollinating almonds for months at that point, uh, and are worn out. Uh, and so they actually come into our farms as as honeybees and aren't really able to work as hard as a native bee might, as a as a solitary bee, uh, a ground nesting bee might. Uh, and as a result, you know, we're we're at the we're, we're, we we find ourselves sort of at the whim of a of a of a system that exists on the, you know, it, it, it exists as a degraded system. And uh, we've, we, we're, we're trying to grow food in degraded systems and that's why we rely on, 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 on rented bees. By the way, I'm not, uh, this is not my Oprah moment where I'm denigrating uh, a whole industry of people that are working on, on, on some kind of part of the food system. I love honeybees. I love the fact that honeybees are, they're, they're amazing. They're amazing creatures, but I, but I want to see more landscapes that have uh, thriving um, diversity of species. And that includes not only the, the, the pollinators that have, you know, have historically operated on landscapes like, like the Willamette Valley in, in, in Oregon and all over the world, um, but have, have really been challenged by uh, land use changes and practices that have really compromised their habitat over time. And so, you know, as, as part of a food, as sort of a food system ethos, you know, we really wanted to try to, 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 to focus on that. And by the way, you know, it, when you think about rented bees, and I'm just going to be really practical here, when you think about rented bees, it all comes down to farming costs. Those, the, the, the cost to us as an operator who, who are producing large volumes of organic blueberries to the marketplace um, all over the country, um, the, the way we're able to provide those products to large numbers of consumers is to try to focus on reducing our farming costs over time, to try to manage our costs, to try to be efficient with what we do so that we can deliver those products at, at, at the lowest possible price to consumers. Renting bees is, is, a, is an expensive proposition and, and so many aspects of what we do are, 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 are very expensive. And so we've been really focused for a, a period of time on trying to think about, well, if we focused on our own marketing, if we, if we built our own brand and marketed our own berries, uh, for example, could we tell more of a story? And so over the last couple of years, We've had a product in the market called uh, uh, Betterful Blueberries, and these are regenerative organic certified. And we've been marketing them uh, in a number of different contexts. Hopefully you've seen them in some of the places that you're familiar with. Um, I, I won't list retailers here, but they're, they're out in the market right now. I bought some myself this weekend. Um, and, you know, I'm really happy with the quality, the flavor. They're really managed to sort of a high, 
we, we, we we're very focused on sorting these berries off of, off the farm to a very uh, very specific um, very, very very clear specifications in terms of um, flavor uh, in terms of size uh, so that we can really deliver something that really is better in the market but all this to being said we are relying today on a certification that doesn't really tell most consumers what it is we're what it is we're doing. Yes, it may send a signal, I, and I, I believe strongly in that signal, that it was grown organically, that it was grown with regenerative practices, that it was grown in a context where there were soil building activities and habitat building activities and a lot of positive attributes. What it doesn't do is tell the consumer specifically, what is the nutritional benefit of that fruit? What actually happened on that farm? What were how healthy were the bees? How healthy were the? How healthy was the soil? What actually happened on the farm to deliver something to me as a consumer that I can really understand um, um, and 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 uh, understand what I'm what I'm eating when I'm feeding it to my children or feeding it to my family? And so that's why we're excited about this project because we really wanted to try to understand that. We'd like to be able to provide more data to consumers. I love for this website eatbetterful.com to have information all over it that shows all the information that we're able to do on a, on a project like this uh, to convey, or, or even, I mean, you know, I, I look at Ben's website and I think about that, that as well, be able to convey something powerful about the fruit. The problem is we're very practical, as I said. We, we know that most consumers aren't gonna go to a website before they make a decision about their food. They're not gonna read extensive materials about, about products when they buy them. Um, in, in store, they're going to go make a decision about the, the look and feel of the product, um, the price of the product, uh, a couple of signals that are related that, that largely relate to certifications, and then make a decision about what to do. And so we're in that dynamic right now where, and I think hopefully we'll have a nice conversation here today about kind of how do we bring this information forward? If, the, if, if there's real evidence to suggest that there's uh, landscape health being delivered through regenerative practices, that there's the nutritional density being delivered to, to, uh, through regenerative practices. How do we convey that? What is that message? And again, I want to be very, very practical about it because we may be self-selecting in, in our group here today or in the folks that are listening in a very narrow segment of the consumer marketplace. But when you think about the need to bring regenerative and organic products to consumers, we have to democratize that food system. We have to be focused on feeding more people with this, with better, with healthier, cleaner food. I fundamentally believe that. And if we don't do that, we're, we're really failing. I think as a, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a part, as a part, and still a very, very small part of the global food system. So we're really trying to challenge those issues. Um, we're really excited about our blueberries. We also have a large citrus business. Um, if you've ever had a Sumo Citrus, you bought our, one, of our, one of our major products. That was not part of this project, but I really am excited about uh, the potential to be able to uh, look at citrus down the road through, through this lens uh, and see kind of what we can learn from, from that side of things. We're actually in the process of growing beyond blueberries and citrus into other crops. And so we're obviously very excited about the potential uh, learnings here and how this uh, how this conversation and this network will kind of inform the next uh, the next phase for us. So I'll pause and um, um, happy to come back to these topics at any point. Thank you, Rod. Um, I had some technical difficulties for a minute, but I'm back. Um, I'll share my screen just for a couple more comments, um, and we'll try to wrap up by. It's not by the hours, so we have plenty of time for discussion. So, um, so as I mentioned, the you know, in order to advance the potential of regenerative ag um, agriculture, um, the potential that regenerative agriculture presents in improving individual and community health. Um, as well as mitigating climate change, improving soil health, building community resilience, and um, all of the value propositions that, that David outlined. Uh, there's significant capital needs to be deployed on farms as well as across value chains and, and across um, all of those different 
consumer um, and and demand businesses that were, that were also described earlier. So um, in 2019, we had put out this report that the screenshot is up there of called uh, Soil Wealth, uh, Investing in Regenerative Agriculture Across Asset Classes. And we outlined 67 different mechanisms, instruments, and approaches that we had inventory um, that could be used to invest in, in this space. Um, we had documented at the time around 127 US-focused investable strategies with combined assets under management of $321 billion um, that were explicitly integrating sustainable food and agriculture thematically or as a criteria in the investment process. The, uh, the space of investing in regenerative agriculture has increased quite a bit since then. It's um, there, there, a recent report that just came out from um, Rockefeller Foundation listed that you know the, the need for the global the global need for transition is estimated to be right now around 200 to 450 billion per year over the next decade. Um, but the funding flows are really only about a tenth of that need um, as measured now. However, there is a lot more activity than when we put, put this report out in 2019. Um, so one of the things I want to highlight is work that's been done um, in parallel with this as part of our matching work has been to develop an update to the, the data set that we presented in that 2019 report. Um, it'll be an interactive um, down, uh, website on our website, um, interactive database that um, will outline what we're seeing in the space across asset classes. Um, those, you know, the different mechanisms that we identified have a different level of readiness. Some of them, are established and out in the marketplace. Some of them are there and ready to scale, but others are just, uh, in this report, you'll see some ideas that were just seeds or, or seedlings, um, as you can see through the, the graphic um, display there on the top. Um, but you know, one of the things that we're focused on in our work um, is around you know, building soil health and community wealth. Um, we need to, to figure out how to activate more investment capital. And so through this project, we've been uh, leveraging the research on food quality marketplaces and the type of data that we're learning about um, to figure out if we can attract more finance to soil health building conservation or generative practices. These are examples of some of the um, financial mechanisms that we're, we're exploring in our conversations. For example, um, the different asset classes are across the top, cash, fixed income, or public debt, private debt, public equity, private equity and venture capital and real assets or farmland. Um, you know, the, these are all um, opportunities that um, we've identified and, and are, are continuing to, to ask the questions about how this can um, support the farms and the food businesses and, and the value chain businesses across. So uh, we've been conducting a series of interviews with senior level bankers, investors, and lenders and um, researching and identifying the financial mechanisms that will unlock that capital. Um, to date, we've um, found that the majority of asset, well, actually, I'll have to go to the next slide. I think we have that. Um, the majority of innovative financial investors are really gap filling the needs to support conservation, agriculture, and businesses. They are often the only investor that is filling that need um, like that that farm uh, or business can go to because the banks are not um, supportive or they're they're not able to fill the, the niche that they're at um, so they're they're innovating to do to fill those needs um, they also um, we've been hearing that they many of these investors have reflected on the fact that the impact data that many investors, impact investors care about is really burdensome for producers. It doesn't mean that they can't, they don't want to collect it, but in some cases they're trying to figure out ways, how, how can we go beyond um, kind of the burden of data collection on the individual farmer? And, and how can we kind of um, still be able to tell the story of what's happening on the ground um, by minimizing that? So that's some of the kind of initial insights some of the opportunities, and again, this is very, we're still in the process of analyzing our, our research, um, but th there's a need for more fast money, um, such as bridge loans. Um, there is um, 
there's a need for more blended capital models, for example, uh, with subordinated debt, equity, and grants. So pooled funding um, would be helpful without the need for each um, each partner to do individual data collection and, and, and instead kind of have um, areas of focus for the investor that they can kind of trust that they can invest in and it'll be managed on the ground. And so um, there have been attempts that were to do this, and, but nothing's really been grown and scaled to meet the need that, that they have identified. And then there's a lot of people have been talking about um, the need for kind of the due diligence um, is really important part of the work but when you're investing in small um, or or diversified operations that trust and place-based impact is really important and um, uh, having expertise in either impact areas or and or specific regions increases the ability for money to move more quickly and not for for groups to track that impact so how do we invest in communities or uh, areas of, of a specific, you know, a specific part of the system um, where someone is able to kind of be the trustee and understand and, and track that without each individual investor having to track that for, for uh, at the farm level, right? So um, some of those first things. And then there's about the role of catalytic capital, um, you know, philanthropy and government have an important role in helping really, um, really accelerate or unlock some of the private investment capital. So things like credit enhancements and loan guarantees or um, foundations and, and philanthropic donors can give uh, first loss capital where they take a subordinated position so that other investors who maybe don't have the same risk tolerance can go, come in um, and, and increase the total availability of capital is really important. Uh, an interesting takeaway was that government programs are both an asset and sometimes a barrier for lenders because sometimes the lender may not be able to compete with the government's preferable financing needs. On the other hand, um, or financing terms, uh, on the other hand, the um, the government um, programs can be real, really an asset um, in that they can be part of a larger like integrated capital approach. So the, the conservation finance may support um, the farm operations uh, while uh, providing some of those biodiversity habits, habitats, um, but also, you know, other needs on the farm can then be financed through the um, investor as well. So very top level um, takeaways. And I, I think I'll stop there and um, let us switch to the conversation. And I have shared a bunch of the links. I've been trying to get everyone's stuff uh, up there, but feel free to ask if there's more information people would like. Great. This is amazing. Um, so now we have a half an hour for Q&A. And I would invite each of you to pose a question to each of the other and start with Wood. One question, minute and a half, or answer, then circle around. Did you say start with me? I, I wasn't ready for yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, what do you have questions for each person? Well, uh, I you caught me off guard, Dan. Sorry, I, I'm I, I'm not I'm not I'm not locked and loaded here on a question, but um, uh, just deep, pondering it myself. Deep, actually, process. I mean, there's amazing energy here, but you're in a place to do things. We're all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think, uh, gosh, you. you know, uh, I, I, I do think sometimes the, the questions for me come to come, come down to, I mean, I, I've, Ben and I have had some conversations over the, over the months about what they've built. And, uh, you know, I do, I am curious sometimes Ben sort of how the, the problem that I, that I articulated <laughs> might be solved by kind of what you're trying to do. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very, cognizant of scale differences right and and if you're if you're i mean we're the largest organic blueberry producer in north america so you know is that appropriate for a platform like yours how, how do how am i served by that or is there an is there something else that i should be thinking about there because i do 
you know, I, I, I worry that we're not, um, we've got all this great data, we've got all this great information. And yet, um, if, if, the, if the data flows aren't working properly, if the data flows aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and the right people aren't, aren't seeing the information, um, we're not going to have, we're not going to have consumer decisions made based on, yep. you know, based on this kind of content. So I'm curious when you heard, when you hear that challenge that I articulate, Ben, if you have any thoughts on sort of how, you know, how you solve a need at scale. For two minutes, then David, then Christy. Okay. I'll do my best for two minutes. Uh, yeah. So what we have had numerous conversations on this and, and I will just say that from our side of it, we're focused on, you know, how to communicate that data across the complexities of these supply chains. And number one is identifying the data that has value to some market somewhere. So that's why a lot of this industry has hinged its wag, you know, hitched its wagon to carbon because carbon is currently showing market signals. So now everyone is trying to create carbon data. Uh, we've very much been focused on the connection between that nutritional outcome of a food that's not a highly processed food in a box, it's a blueberry or it's a vegetable or it's a cut of beef or a cut of chicken, whatever it may be, and understanding that how that product is produced dramatically impacts the quality of that product to the consumer. So the, like we, if you look at just our platform as we showed it today, it's, it's data intake, data organization, data distribution. It doesn't get real sexy with the consumer interface but that is the next piece of this whole thing is to take our data and put it on label in a way that there's a digital, there's digital content creation behind that data. So your marketing strategy becomes fed by real data about ecosystem impact. So when you're delivering anything to that consumer, it's very much targeted on the types of information that you want democratized within the food system. It's the fact that we're all here for people and planet outcomes and we're, and, and and returns to our products, right? Uh, but most importantly, we're all here to service the mission of people and planet and returns for, for a business that's a part of this. And I think the, the last piece we are bringing in is the consumer connection. So how do we take that data, create digital content, create the engagement that you need from the consumer that says, hey, that consumer does value the type of information that we're collecting in our supply chain and bringing to them in that experience. That's where, you know, that's, we didn't show that piece of our business today, but that last mile that we're connecting to the consumer yeah. is the most important part of all of this because that's where the transactions happen and that's where the value starts to go back upstream. So question for David or Christy? David, you came off mute, but I'm happy to. It would, what, what is still muted? You got the answer to that question. Oh, it's back to me. A different question <laughs> to uh, David or Christy, or? Uh, uh, well, I mean, you know, David, you you talked about you talked about um, uh, the, 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 what, whether this actually generates premiums at some point, uh, and I you know I I don't I don't know you know what your what your thoughts are there. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, I I'm even though I know premiums are important and they're important incentives and signals for folks in the market you know i i at a certain point i i i want to see a marketplace where you know uh everybody every everybody has access to the best food available but i but that said um you know i think one of the one of our learnings over time from a practical standpoint is that the amount of information that you put on a package or the amount of information you put on it you put it at a, at a, a put you put it next to a product on shelf um has a limit there's a there's a there, there's a there's a point at which there's a they're, they're diminishing returns in terms of being able to convey something um to consumers so i'm curious when you think about the level of um I can still barely say this word, metabolomic data, all the things that you're focused on uh, as a researcher. Can I, how, do you, how do you feel like it, you can elevate it to, um, to, 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 to be useful to someone who's making a decision in a, in a, moment's, in a moment's time? Um, I, I, you know, that, that's one of those issues that I just feel like I've been working in this space for a long time and I still don't think we have that resolved. And so I, I think what, what ends up happening is we live in a world of certifications. We live in a world where brands have to mean something. Brands have to convey something because people don't have 
the amount of time to really spend uh, to dig into sort of all the data that are behind this. So I'm curious what your take on that. Is the is the you me or is the you Dan? Dan, I was like you. David, I was talking to you, David. Because <laughs> I bet Dan has an opinion on that question too. Uh, I, I'm just host. Yeah. <laughs> no, two. So two or three things. This is great. Um, um, an observation first about this this SIG project. Um, one of our goals in asking the Bionutrient Food Association if they would participate was that we actually weren't sure whether, we didn't know what this metabolomic data would show. If we go back three years, what, what we now know is it was fascinating and in-depth and complex, and it's not quite clear where to go with it. We didn't actually know that three years ago. So we can, we can thank this project in part for giving us the resources to produce that data with which to arrive at this conclusion, which is, ooh, this is not as silver bullet as we hoped. Okay, that's that's not what we wanted necessarily, but it's important to know that now, much more, much more so than than we knew it when we started this thing. Um, so that's one thought. I'd just like to play that back, and and I think of it as an accomplishment of this project. Um, the other the other um, observation I have that connects back to what what Wood and Ben were saying is that in my work, which tends to be with on the ground usually place-based innovators at, at some scale, right? Some, some not at scale, some small community operations and some that have scaled to thousands of farmer participants, right? But in, in, in the cases that are most exciting, most vibrant, succeeding most economically, they're highly customized solutions where that, that place-based innovator looked across these value propositions and the local local supporters in the local regulatory context, and sometimes with our with our support, I gotta, I gotta flag that, um, um, meaning our analytic, our hand-holding, our day-to-day our -day rolling up our sleeves together support, um, figured out what three or four different revenue sources could be for their set of operations. So rather than trying to load their product with a single premium or a single label, and sell it to a single consumer base. They said, wait a minute, we're actually providing biodiversity restoration that these foundations over here wanna pay for. And we'll just wall that off. <laughs> and over here, we're selling corn to the market. And we'll just wall that up, we'll just sell corn. And over here, we're, you know, selling could mean selling in a commercial market or selling to a, a different funding mechanism, right? You know, we're selling some wildlife conservation. And by, by packaging those three together, we're doing okay. We're growing pretty fast. But it took this, the word aggregated with a little asterisk next to it on my slide. <laughs> That's what that meant. It was like, there's some behind the scenes. Don't ask the farmer to think through all of these pieces every time. Don't ask the consumer to comprehend all of them in an instant when they're looking at the supermarket shelf, right? So who's that? You know, so, so that's an exciting thing and what does that imply for public policy? What does that imply for scale? What does that imply for standardization and certifications and market infrastructure? I'm not sure. So part of this has been the quest to figure out, you know, how to bridge from, from that world of, of exciting innovation on the ground impact. Um, another participant in this project has been a Native American farmer entrepreneur named, named Buck Johnston in Taos, New Mexico. So I'll call him out because he's an active participant. He's doing great. It, I mean, he's working hard with his people and his farmers and the community, but the municipality is supporting him, the consumers are supporting him, but it's a, it's a, it's a local puzzle that he's assembling, right? Um, last, last, last comment I would make, and I bounce this back to Christy some, is that, you know, the finance side of that, I've always hoped would be the integrative tissue that I just named 13 economic values. We can customize them on a case-by-case -case basis and package them up for what pretty vibrant it's still local regional operation. Unless we had someone institutionalized on the finance side who would be willing to invest in or support or fund some of these different values across the spectrum, wherever you come from. And I guess Christy would would the yeah, right? Q and A right now for the first 10 minutes and then yep. you can pass it around. But you if you want to have Christy do it, that's fine. 
Well, I, I'll just follow up a little on that. I think there yeah. are investors. Is my audio okay, by the way? Yep, it's right, great. Right. Uh, there are investors who um, do care about those different items, but it's not always straightforward on how to, There, in, in the space that we're looking at, it, it's not necessarily um, clear how to do it, but I think that's exactly what we're looking at is how, how do you create more revenue or, or support for the um, those ecosystem services, those social and cultural and eco ecological value adds, um, and then the health. And I think that, you know, this project kind of started with the health vision. I know that what, some investors we talked to, uh, the foundation has, it has really been putting an energy around the school, um, farm to school approaches, but, the, you know, so if we could shift, and if that's something we explored in the research as well, we could shift all of the um, food that's getting distributed through government procurement yeah. to regenerative practices because of not just the ecological benefit, but like the nutritional benefits that could come along with that, and also the the environmental health benefits that come along with the people growing that food. I mean, the the impact is huge, I and mean, the government procurement of um, U.S. government procurement of uh, food products in the U.S. is just, I want to say 40%. I don't have a number in front of me, but it was, it's quite large um, and could be transformational, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that the government is used to paying a premium. And so it's really doing it for those other values that it cares about, um, you know, improving the health ecosystem. The government pays subsidies, right? So, right. It's, it's right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, no, I think that's a good question. Would last question before we move on? Or yeah, on? Christy, Christy, I'm wondering if you think there's a role, um, you know, I, we, we, I, I brought up the, the P word, so I, the premium word, so I, like I, I'm, I'm going to push that a little further. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a role? I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm quite interested in, in the opportunity that should exist, I think, to find um, other buyers, <laughs> other investors in ecosystem services, frankly, to help support uh, regenerative transitions and trans tr re regenerative management, not necessarily burdening the consumer with that decision, not necessarily burdening a small number of consumers, because at the end of the day, we still are talking about incredibly small numbers of people <laughs> who are buying organic, who are buying regenerative food, which is sad and shocking to me. At the same time, we've got to transition acreage uh, into, into these kinds of practices. And so I'm curious about your thoughts as a, uh, you know, from, from the unique place that you all sit uh, in terms of sort of where and how um, uh, ecosystem service markets can be and should be, um, you know, stimulating uh, or, or de-risking some of those transitions in, in places where consumers don't. <laughs> Frankly, I, I won't say can't, but don't. Yeah, I, that, that, I mean, that's a great question. It's something we're also exploring um, because, yeah, say the carbon credit markets that Ben, I think you mentioned, you know, Microsoft maybe pays $100 for a carbon credit and for a ton of carbon and the, the forester um, or agroforester gets maybe $10. And so there's a lot of loss in there of someone is taking capturing that value and that it's not translating into being able to, um, I mean, it is creating a new revenue stream, but is that the right balance of who's, who's capturing that profit? Um, so we're, we are trying to explore how to uh, work with small and medium land holders or stewards to aggregate, as, as David suggested, some of those benefits in a way that isn't super burdensome, right? We put a lot on the shoulders of the farmers to measure impact, to figure out all these different conservation programs. So we're, we're working on the ground with farmers, landowners, and land stewards to figure out kind of in practice what it takes and then try to create new mechanisms to aggregate that. I don't think there, um, there's a clear path yet, but there are people that are trying, trying to innovate on that. Um, and um, I agree with you actually, what about the, the premium? Like that that comes, you know, when we talk about the value proposition, the truth is 
Shifting to organic is often sold as something that you can get a price premium if you can just survive the three, you know, three or four years value valley of death when you have to change your your practices and change, invest in those transitions and you can't get the pre premium for a few years until you're certified. But the, the promise of regenerative practices is that you're actually building your soil health, your resilience, you're reducing the risks uh, we, um, and like the, the risks on the farm, but you're also then reducing risks to the community and the larger systemic risks like climate change. So those things need to be valued um, just as well as the price that you're getting at the end of the, this particular year, because knowing that you're not gonna um, lose your crop to a drought because your soil is healthier is valuable, right? You can smooth out that variability. So I think that, um, I, I think those those parts are is something that's starting to make its way into the investment landscape. Um, we put out a report that last February that kind of talks about the risk mitigation of using conservation practices across those different levels from the farm to off farm um, and systemic. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot of work that's been done in that space. But we're my concern is that we're the price premium approach really like like you said would focuses on those who can afford to access the nutritional benefits. Of course, they're, you know, they're providing an, a, an access point to grow that market, but it's very slow. So how do we, um, how do we shift things a little more quickly? So I don't have the silver bullet, but that's exactly what we're working on. Right. Ben, you, you did some work on the same question, right? How so are... We got 10 minutes left, David. Sorry. So the just conversation, we got 10 minutes left and we gave uh, Wood 20 of it. So you get a comment and a question and then each of you do. Ben and it, you just, you guys go down, like comment and question. Then we open it to the conversation of the people in the community. I'm going to kind of start my my, my comment is Ben has talked for two years, if I heard him correctly, about um, burdening the farmer and what kind of premium he can realize on a product when it has this data attached to it. So these are not new themes. Someone really smart has been thinking about them and working on them because that, that's my comment. Yeah. Um, um, and I guess that the, the question I have in general is, is about the distinction of product labeling that is based on data versus the distinction of product labeling that is based on storytelling. Because as we did the market segment research, I really found resonance with storytelling, but it was a limited pool. This wasn't a definitive study. Um, so the question is, does anybody have any other insights on that, that point? So, I would just provide mine very quickly. And then my insight is that it's, it needs to be both. It needs to be storytelling around the real data that's authentic and true to the true to the cause. And that we have to get beyond this, uh, you know, the, I don't wanna use, I think even greenwashing is overused. So uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily wanna focus on this from a greenwashing perspective, but I do think that our traditional standards for how we market brands needs to change. And we need to start filling those that content creation with the type of data that we're all saying is important to the market. And that type of data is how it impacts the planet, how it impacts the people, and then build our marketing story instead of how colorful, how you know, how many sports stars can we get on our box, how colorful can we make the different color components of our scheme on our labels, and those types of things. I think we spend far too many resources and marketing department budgets on that type of marketing strategy and not putting truth to claims and bringing the information forward that we know and that we're all saying as a group that the new generations of consumers will want as they start buying products. We have to create that marketing experience for them. It doesn't exist today. So you just answered the question. Um which was, you know, who are you, what are you doing? And what's your thought about what has been said? I think you just answered that. So do you have any other comments or questions? I just have one question for our group and 
I, I, it's a question I haven't asked before among all the other questions, but as, as we as a group think of the term stewardship or conservation, do we think that is a fundamental of agriculture or do we think that's an opportunity to incentivize agriculture as a, as a group here in this SIG based on how we've seen Seventh generation um, mind is foundational, I would say. I don't think everybody's stewards, Ben. I think some I think some people steward and some people don't. <laughs> so I, I think it I think it's the, the aspiration, but it's not the reality. Yeah, I see it. I see it. This is my profession, but I see it through the lens of incentives. And these can be financial incentives, political incentives, cultural incentives, any kind of incentive, but but each individual is distinct and there are, you know, if you use the economic language, their utility function is built by the incentives they see the world through. And I aspire to the vision of stewarding the environment and people. But I don't think that's how, that's not how I engage with people, personally. It's, it's my entire life purpose, personally. But I think of like, what incentives do they face and why and how do we shift those incentives? All right, Christy. Yeah, the, you want I think, your question. A question or response. Your comment first, and then first your the comment. I just I agree with that. That it, I mean, the vision is right that we're not charging a premium for regenerative agriculture and conservation agriculture. That's just what we do, and that's how food is grown, and we steward the land and and the people and the community. Um, but yes, that's something that I think is more aspirational still. And so, how to shift the conversation goes beyond, you know any one piece of this is a whole systems change that, that we're working towards. Um, I had a comment also, someone, maybe, maybe it was Wood talked about, um, someone mentioned that, you know, what, what do we do with the metabolomics type of data that was so new and so innovative, like so different than any of our partners had ever seen. And of course, Dan and the BFA have been looking at these diagrams and reading the data for a while. And I just wanted to flag that this is, Really, um, what the the scientist that is working with you all, uh, Stefan von Vliet, told us is this is where the state of vitamins were many many years ago. We're just getting to know what is what the different components of antioxidants and and the different parts of the um, you know the blueberry does for us for our health. Um, we understand how it might be interacting with the soil. Uh, but I think that it's really exciting because right now we know that people care about what vitamins they eat <laughs> and they might actually, you know, change their habits to try to be more nutrition, add more nutrition to th themselves or their families. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm hopeful that this type of work is, you know, yes, it, it, there's a whole set of consumer segments that could have um, high demand for these things when they understand the nutritional and other food quality components and other uh, value propositions. Um, but I do wonder, you know, how indeed thanks to Dan as well as um, you know in the group, you know, what a lot of the health benefits come from eating whole unprocessed foods. And then there's a component of eating the regeneratively grown foods. And so how do you help communicate that distinction? And um, how how do we move this work forward in the right direction to, to, to illuminate that part of it, the nutritional components of this growing food this way. That's a beautiful question. All right, what do you guys think? And it's a really good question. It's a really good question. It it implies to me something we've observed for a lot of years, which is that it's it, it needs you need to get the the health and wellness side people in the room, the health and wellness side influencers in the room with the farming food and viral side influencers, and it's really hard to do a lot of the time. Um, we've been able to convene for almost ten years now the environmentalists with the farmers with the food producers, or the farmers with the food producers with the health people, but it's really hard to get those health folks, I'm overgeneralizing, in the room with the environmental folks. 
Uh, I think the language, the analytics, a lot of these things are just different. They, we're working on the new vocabulary to, to, to weave those threads together. Be, be, because I guess implied in my in my reaction there is that we need the health and wellness side to send the signal about the nutritional benefits and the health benefits. I, I mean, to me, if the if the if the data correlate to flavor, <laughs> if, the, if the data correlate to sort of a better tasting experience, um, you know, it's all the sky's the limit. I mean, I think the the breakthrough for us years ago when we realized, you know, we could talk about species abundance and species richness on the pollinator and and, and beneficial predator and invertebrates side of things all day long. But when we started to realize that if we had more solitary bees working, uh, uh, living on the farm, <laughs> uh, and I'm switching off of, of David's research, but but more, more, more native bees on the farm, we actually had Better, better berries. The berries were larger. The berries were, were better, uh, and so you know, we hence hence this sort of betterful message that I alluded to. So anyway, it's all, it, taste carries the day. I think if and, and if it and taste if taste is if taste is healthier, then we've got. Some... I would throw in one little nuance that a personal learning point over the last few years, and it resonates in the market research also. We, just to add this in, which is taste and aroma. Aroma turns out to be a driver amongst the chefs, often more so than the flavor. Something to play with a little bit. Ben, you wanna speak? No. Uh, I don't have too much extra to contribute to that one. I think that's taste and flavor, uh, taste and aroma have been part of the soil health conversation my whole time in soil health here. And that's over 10 years now we've talked about how soil health and ecosystem health impact flavor and aroma and all of those things. And I think the key piece of that story here is in, uh I've been hearing that for 10 years and here we still are talking about it. So uh, again, like I'm going to come back to the fact that until we produce the data about the how those happen, uh, just like this nutrition data, until we understand the actions that need to be in place to create the nutritional outcomes that we're chasing. And then to do that, you know, having these authentic connections back to where production happens and not overlooking the producers as part of this equation, that's a, a you know now we're tying it back into the incentivization opportunities the investment opportunities whatever it may have uh, yeah it's really whatever you pick as your north star in this conversation the reality is is that better practices equal better outcomes for for all of us and that's you know let's just figure out which part that's of the story that really that complicated about. yeah it's like yeah. <laughs> do more well and it will happen more well yeah right yeah so we have a uh, questions in the q and I mean, I, I would be happy to take a back seat and you guys engage those questions. Sure. Um, maybe we'll take it from the top. So um, Sherry asks if we could share how to obtain the reports and we did that in the um, in the notes. I don't know if, I think I did it in the chat, um, but Dan, we would be able to share that after the, Yep. I don't know if you're doing that. Okay. Yep. Everything Great. is. Yep. Uh, David, in your consumer sa segment slide, were the segments ranked in order of participation? That's, um, okay. Yeah. Are we, we're referring to the question about food service companies. Sorry. Uh, this is um, the consumer segments identified in, in your slide about individual chefs, like who, who's who's demanding these value propositions. Uh, this or who is who could be. Um, just, so, yeah. just the glitch of the system is that I responded privately to that question, so it disappeared from my screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see that, but it's still in mind. So, did you, did you say yes then or no? Yeah, yeah. So, so I said yes. Those 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 consumer those fourteen consumer segments were loosely presented in order of their their the degree of their participation in these markets and their influence on these markets. 
Um, and I'll, uh, for example, and this one is important, I think, in the conversation we were just having, um, chefs, restaurants, and bakeries are number two on the list. And uh, they're number two in terms of dominating transactions that are taking place um, that we have actually observe. And uh, also because they're incredibly influential in terms of reaching consumers. So uh, this would suggest, but again, I have some bias. We've been trying to do this for years. Is, you know, that's, where's the chef, <laughs> right? In this, in this panel today, because these are people who food and flavor and the essence of the experience and caring for the consumer is, is the business of a lot of them, you know? Um, and and they, they don't think the same way that some of us more analytic folks do necessarily. So, uh, but that, that order of, you know, of consumer segments is in fact reflective of, it's not a strict study, by, but reflective of the general proportionality of their, their involvement in the sectors. Thanks. Um, and there's a related question around um, if the group can speak to what degree that, that larger food service companies are searching out regeneratively grown products, and perhaps more importantly, how are those organizations integrating that within their buying or corporate rebate programs? I can I can speak to that briefly. I, I see it on the uh, there's a little bit of a little bit on the retail side, um, not not as much as I would have expected at this particular at this particular point. Um, again, most of them are relying on signals, non-data driven signals, certification signals to make those determinations. Uh, I see more interesting work going on in supply chains where CPGs are consumer packaged goods companies are digging into where their where their ingredients are coming from and want to be able to either ensure they have regenerative attributes um, and, and data driven regenerative attributes um, uh, and or <laughs> are contributing to uh, um, uh, uh, supply chain carbon 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 removals. So uh, an ingredient company might be, I mean, a, 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 a large company might be buying ingredients that, it, that are gonna help it manage its uh, overall carbon footprint more effectively. I see that more, more, than, more than the retail side. Uh, going down um, the list. I'm sorry, guess, see, okay, can I jump in? Let me mention one more quick example from our work I'm just recalling. There is a story of, um, out of the farmer in Montana that I mentioned earlier that produced the Gruff Fritz product. Um, an interesting thread that I've been looking for for years and haven't found is some of the institutional food supply companies, right? Which, which is, I, I'm not sure the value, I'm not sure the conclusion here other than they, the story goes they were presenting at a food market in Montana in which a university food service, a Montana-based land-grant university food service participated in the food market and learned about their product and was excited because both the, the nutritional sales pitch was compelling and it was all Montana grown. And so the university food service manager took it back to the large Montana university and, and requested or somehow facilitated that their student food service begin serving this kind of product, which led to a the observation of the of the challenge that the food service is beholden to the supplies available through their institutional supplier. So, so it took demand from the university to get the attention then of, of a large institutional food supplier whose name we would all know, who said, we don't supply, we don't know how to supply that product. That's not what we do. <laughs> but so there's some, that's still, the story is still playing out, but there's some some request from a large consumer to the food supplier to supply this product, which isn't in their business model, it's not their supply chain, right? And so I just find it to be an informative and interesting story. And I've met now people all along that storyline and they're all fascinating, caring, intelligent people, each of whom has their own business they're in, right? They're sort of taking a new cut through their, the way they've done things traditionally. Yeah, that's a great point. Um... I, there's another example um, that I came across it in Boston. One of our um, food incubators is helping source cover crops, turning yellow peas from cover crops into a field falafel. So it's a common kitchen. Um, 
So they're incentivizing another revenue source for a conservation practice. And then they're marketing it and selling it to institutional buyers like hospitals, where they're also able to you know, tell the story, provide the nutritional benefits. Um, so there, there's a lot of power in getting into those large corporate um, food service providers. If, if you can increase that similar to the school to farm or farm to school um, programs across the states and across the world actually that's, that program is some people are doing farm to school um, trying to think about how to do that globally um, I see a question here um, about so I appreciate the challenge Wood mentioned around the consumer choice points of visual feel price and certifications uh, my business highlights the correlation of flavor to nutrient density. Would you anticipate that an opportunity to taste at purchase point could become an economic driver toward regen or soil health? So samplings, I guess, an opportunity to sample. Um, yeah, samplings, like everything. <laughs> I like samples. <laughs> Is that something you guys have done with the Betterful? Flavor berries? You know, it's a good question. I don't know that I'm. 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 I, I'm I, I should ask the team if we've actually done any sampling. We. We. That's. A, we. It was like a huge part of the Stonyfield story. I mean, we. we Stonyfield, you know, famously sampled sampled the heck out of <laughs> out of his yogurt to kind of get the brand going. Uh, it's, a, it's always a, always a, a, a good lesson for for folks that are getting started. So we should we should be if we're not. Well, I can ask. Um. Would the next question is would it be up to consumers to pay a premium considering current food prices? Or is it the retailers or producers that benefit most from the from regenerative ag, um, such as shelf life, quality, et cetera, and should be the ones that are absorbing the price and compensating producers for higher quality produce? The retailer also benefits through more resilient through more resilient supply chains. Love to see more retail activity. I think I've already made that point. Yes, we'd love to see more more retail signals. It'd be great. And the signals we're seeing right now are the there's a lot of kicking it down the hill uh, going on. So whoever's at the top of the hill is kicking it to the next one, who's kicking it to the next one, and then kicking it to the next one. Yeah. Uh, I think that's going to happen for quite some time. I think as we all know in this, I mean, not everyone in this call, but I think this group knows is that people that buy food from farms don't want to pay more for that food. They want to pay less every time. Uh, so it's it's this challenging situation of telling them it's better, but th and then asking to pay, get more money out of that experience because you did more to make it better and then having them want to pay you less. And in fact, then the, the 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 not just the not just the buyer themselves, but the the person responsible for the buying is incentivized to buy it for less. <laughs> not just the yeah. not just the not just the organization, but the person is incentivized to buy it for a huge factor. Yeah, like their their actual salary and bonus structure probably depends on their ability to buy it at a lower mark, you know, a, a better margin opportunity for the company. Um, which again is my. You know, this is the question that we get a lot of times. I've been, I've heard a large, very large food company that we would all know say that the advantage a producer gets out of regenerative agriculture is basically enlightenment. Uh, you know, and uh, part of me doesn't disagree with that because so many of us have removed an opportunity for that experience in agriculture as farmers, right? I mean, that's one of the issues I had with my own farming operation and my family was that we had removed all ecosystems from the experience so we could have as many acres of production as possible, right? That's just how conventional agriculture functions. And uh, But to me, that's also, you know, as an agriculturalist or a farmer or someone that has been ingrained in that lifestyle, part of the reason for that is the connection to nature. And, um, but I think it's pretty hypocritical to say that you're in agriculture because you're connected to nature, but you're in a system that has removed it from all operations. So it, it, that uh, this is why I asked the question to the group. I think this is a question that we'll all have to face multiple times. Is it a cog to the buyer of a food product or is it a cog to the producer to have positive ecosystem outcomes? Um, it's, it's not different than talking about, oh, go ahead. David Wood and Christy, two minutes, live question. Uh, two more live questions. 
two minutes each on that question. Ah, uh, so I'm happy to offer another anecdote. Yeah. Um, I am developing my own language around some of these business terms. So thank you for your patience. But another anecdote we do have is, which gets back to the, the consumer segment chart I showed, had the consumers on the left and the what, why, what, what is it they're actually buying on the right? And uh, we do have one, one case in our research and set of relationships here where um, what, the, what the large corporate food producer is clearly buying is ESG data because they're, they've actually gone out of their way to purchase regeneratively grown inputs at a higher price and take that data they get for doing that, however they quantify that, and then take the actual product and dump it in with all the other product they bought. Literally dump it in the bin with all the conventionally grown product they bought. And so they can, you know, they're, they're somehow quantifying some proportionality of their own supply stream that can now take credit for having been grown regeneratively but on the consumer side, they're just lumping it in and producing what they produce the way they always have, not even telling the consumer that it's different. It's all about the other side of the data story. Um, I don't know that that can be generalized or anything else, but it was interesting to, 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 to have that conversation. Um, Go ahead, Chrissy. Could, could you reframe the, the question itself? Me. Mute, mute. Ben. Yeah, I'm mute. Yeah, I, the core question was, you know, whose cog is it? I guess is it is it the brand's cog? Is it is it the producer's cog to generate positive ecosystem product or positive people product? However, we're looking at that. Whose responsibility is it to incur that cost initially? Cost, yeah. Uh, right, and and. I think there are um, examples of supply chains um, that we work in with in other parts of, of ESG investing, where, for example, in like um, human rights um, work across like textile supply chains, right? That the big brands are really liable um, and are going to lose a lot of share if they find out that the people that they're distributing their production to are having huge human rights um, violations. So example is a um, after a large uh, factory went uh, collapsed, you know, everyone said, oh, we didn't know that's that's how bad it was. But really the brands are are kind of liable. And so the investors do a lot of engagement around this. And some of our my colleagues are involved in um, thinking about human rights, uh, business and human rights and labor supply chain. Um, issues. Um, so it, I think that, you know, the brands do have a, lot, a reasonable cause to care about the way that their food is produced and therefore have a responsibility in either paying for those changes or paying for um, a premium to get those practices involved um, or, or instituted. And so you'll see things like um, an um, a partner of ours in a former project, USDA project, uh, Organic Valley was providing financing opportunities to their farmers to help make some transitions and regenerative transitions or organic transitions or to install you know, solar panels. Uh, that That is a reasonable, of course, that's a cooperative, so it's a little bit different model, but you'll, you have seen some of the larger brands trying to, to do that, or, um, aggregators to do that. Sometimes it comes on the edge of greenwashing because the question is how shallow uh, are are they really talking about just saying that we're doing some of these regenerative or conservation practices versus really doing it fully to change the structure of the soil and the life of the soil and change the health of the food products as well? Um, so, I mean, I think that's, I think that investors who care about these things are starting to, you know, ask questions of the brands that they're investing in. They're starting to ask, just like we, we've done that with climate, investors have Ask, don't just look at like your scope one emissions, but how, what about scope two, scope three? Um, so the responsibility is still borne by the person that's aggregating and selling the product to the re to the on the retail market. Um, 
as opposed, however, I think what's interesting about the work that we've done is we found that a lot of the people who were shifting their practice necessarily because of a pull from the market, but because of personal held beliefs that this is how food should be grown, or they may have um, encountered their own personal moment or health challenge that wanted them to change what how they were um, interacting with food. So it's not always coming like top down, like we want this product because there's a demand for it, therefore we're gonna pay for it. Sometimes it's it's coming the other way around, bottom up, the communities don't wanna be, you know, dousing pesticides on their food or um, getting food that tastes less delicious or, you know, putting their communities up um, to suffer those consequences um, for more conventional practices. So um, in that case, the cost or the value added is worth you know any costs because you're actually doing it for personal values not for the market so i think that part I, we haven't discussed that part much but um it's something that was kind of a surprising result yeah so ben do you have a question for wood do i no ben I think ben oh go ahead ben. give you a question david question Oh, I will. Be, I'll. I'll let someone else have my time since I just asked that question. I don't want to take too many of those. Yes, yeah. I mean we're going deep in this conversation, so. Yeah, I, I think it, it. I mean, it, it is deep. I think this is a whole. This is kind of sums up the challenge that we're addressing with this grant. Is yeah, are there market signals, and then who pays for those uh, advantages that we're signaling? Right. I think that's the whole point. To get to something that Wood said, like the the you know democratizing the food system is part of this. Like is just like we all should have access to water, shouldn't we all have access to clean food? Like where where in like our food, food system? I mean, where, where in the evolution food. of our food system did we determine that we just needed calories, and it didn't matter on whether or not those okay, calories? Okay, the, no, right. okay. I I think it's interesting. We haven't talked, and this project was not about policy, right? But it, um, there's, you know, the land, the landscape with which we, we work in is how our markets are structured, and how our food system is structured does have a lot to do with policy, and that's not within the scope of this particular project, but is worth acknowledging here that markets play within certain boundaries, and same with um, what we can do on the farm, what subsidies. Someone mentioned subsidies. Um, we're providing so things like crop insurance much easier to get for large commodity crops and harder to get for small specialty crops um, on smaller tracts of land um there's a lot of structural questions that also you know bear a cost um or could pay part of the cost essentially um in incentivizing this transition there's a um completely separate body of academia and environmental philosophy, which was part of my graduate work, but just to say that it observes, I would just throw this out there, that it is the passionate vision holders who change things. And it is often the environmentalists who are those people. They How they change them often involves rippling them down through market structures. But the spark, the the fire, <laughs> the ignition, the the persistence, the sticking with it, historically often has come on other topics from the environmental sector in particular. So whatever that observation is worth, I I hold it in high regard personally because it I, yeah, I hold my feet planted on the ground. I work with people who are passionate, who do hold this aspiration and are going to stick to it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the strategy to apply in this body of thinking does not imply that the strategy is to convince everybody else to hold that same passion. Like you gotta have the people holding the passion and then, <laughs> and then it's too much to, one would theorize, expect everybody else to convert. <laughs> so better to just to play with the incentives they face. So I, I hear reflections of that in this discussion. It could be really interesting and fun to talk about it more. Um, I would say, let me underscore one thing Christy said which is from this research, it's, it's, it's crystal clear on the producer side of, of, of the producers that are involved in the majority of these transactions that we were able to study, 
the producers are motivated by things other than financial incentives from the market. It's crystal clear. They, they believe in their children. They believe in the healthy community. They believe that there's going to be markets in the future if they do it this way today. They are not being motivated by very much market pull today. That's a really good point because it goes a little bit to what you're, what you're saying, Christy, about policy. I mean, at a certain point, if you're, if you're producing responsibly, um, you know, eventually the market will come to you, <laughs> I, I believe. Maybe that's what you're saying, David, is that on some level, you, you know, it, it's important to be a lead. It's important to take, take the lead on these kinds of transitions and, and, and lead the change. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, I think eventually that the, the, <laughs> the reality will emerge for, for all, all kinds of consumers and all kinds of, uh, buyers of these kinds of products. So I, 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 I would, I consider us in that same camp, David, for sure. And some of them may run around behind the scenes trying to send the markets in those directions, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's rooted in that same foundation. <laughs> So there, there's several more questions. I don't know, Dan, if you'd like me to try to answer another one in the last five minutes. We can put a couple more up. Um, but I, I do think that um, this is this is a nice moment. Like we're recognizing that it's the farmer is leading the change in many cases. Um, and then the food system businesses, I think, are also, some of them are taking advantage of the market pull and some of them are doing it for their own um, you know, personal beliefs that this this is how food should be. Uh, investors, just to pull it back up there, what we've heard is even though the data is important for impact investors, it's the story that still matters a lot, um, that people want to see the impact through stories as well on the ground. How is this changing a community? How is this changing the landscape or the biodiversity or the bees? Um, so investors and philanthropy um, care about that part. So that um that seems to be important across across the whole thing and then i mean ben ben and merge are doing a really important part of it which is it's not good enough to just have the story and and you know the data that the fa is producing is helping us see what we can really see underneath on the nutrition side but then there's all the other pieces like um, biodiversity biodiversity data and i think merge also has the biodiversity measurement um, how, how do we see, and I think the important part of it is how do we see the change over time? Because these practices aren't like once and done. It's like your land can continue to regenerate. The food can continue to get more nutritious and healthy um, and the community. And that's the part that we're, we're focused on a lot at Croton is like, how does this build resilience um, in the community that goes beyond purely the health benefits, but economic um, kind of activity in the community more flourishing rural areas. So there's there's a whole level of um, investors okay. and people that care about those different components that are willing to be those first movers, essentially. I think it's been a great opportunity to have a deep conversation. And um, I would welcome each person to invoke their vision, their blessing. I mean, what do you invoke? What do you pray for? And what's your intention? Let's hold space for something we are all doing together. I mean, the only way we can actually do it together is if we actually have a common ground. Um, let's start that process. Got three minutes left. Would <laughs> oh, you're asking? Oh, I thought that was a. Yeah. I thought you were. I thought that was a rhetorical. No, no. It's you get one minute and then we're done. Oh, uh, David. Yeah. That all that 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 yeah. all food um, sequesters carbon, protects biodiversity, uh, builds water resilience, um, uh, and tastes great, <laughs> and that everybody can access it. That's my. That's yeah. what I'm. That's what awesome. I wake up every day trying to do. Awesome. Now, I do this business because of, I want life on earth and uh, I've always worked on environmental issues and it became clear a few years ago that uh, food and health systems 
are environmental issues if done right. Yeah. That's what I hold every time I take a bite of food and play with my children and take a walk in the woods. So, yeah. I would say that all of us at Merge are here for one thing and then another thing. And that one thing is to move the needle on changing agriculture towards, you know, the people planet positive piece. We want to bring that back uh, until we move the needle on that. We haven't done anything. And that does hit, you know, yeah. Uh, bringing in the emissions data that everyone needs. You know, our goal is to move that needle, but I think we've jumped over this data discovery period and yep. trying to get a market. Uh, so before we can do anything in a market, before we can put any fundamentals in a market that make all of this make sense, our goal yep. is to build the connections that allow us to actually see this information, build an emotion behind it, and then make choices on those emotions. And, and, uh, you know, we're going to be here and try to connect the dots between how this good thing in nutrition happens is really because there's a farmer or an operator on a farm that made good decisions and uh, provide them with the appropriate information to make those good decisions. Beautiful. Yeah, at, at um, Croton Institute, where our vision is really to see a place that uh, an equitable world where finance is supporting flourishing communities, vibrant places, and resilient economies. Um, many times, finance is seen as something that can be extracted and looking for returns, and so we're looking at for how to sh turn that around and think about how we're you know, creating that vision of what we. Um, what we'd like to see in the world and through food systems we're, we're really trying to build a just a pathway to a just economy there in, in the rural communities um food systems and far, uh, other farming and forestry fiber systems as well beautiful thank you all thank you thanks everybody thanks Dan. thanks for the audience too yep. thanks yeah thanks Ha <laughs>